Uh, for those that haven't been to one of our meetings before, this is the monthly meetup for the Vancouver Public Space Network. Um, quick recap, the VPSN was founded way back in 2006. Um, we're an all-volunteer, nonpartisan organization that works on all sorts of public space related activities, some placemaking, research, communications. Um, and over the course of a number of years, we've done um, some interesting forays into the area of public art, which we define probably a bit more broadly uh, than, than Eric, or at least from the programmatic uh, respect to the city of Vancouver. We're looking at street art, placemaking uh, generally, the sort of artistic uh, um, uh, aesthetic elements of infrastructure and things like that. Um, and we've done some events that have sort of tried to provoke discussion around public art, um, whether or not it's film festivals, we did some bigger placemaking events in collaboration with 360.org a few years ago, and a number of, of other things. But we now have um, Stina and Adirin, Stina, yeah, yay, Stina and Adirin back, um, who are co-leading our public art portfolio. And this portfolio, we're really grateful to have them involved. It's been a couple of years since we've had a, a um, coordinator or coordinators in that position. And so this evening's uh, event is intended to do a couple things. One, um, to give everyone a chance to learn about the City of Vancouver's public art program and uh, what it covers and the areas of focus, maybe some uh, sense of the directions uh, that it's headed in, but also to have a discussion with each of you around uh, our work on public art as an advocacy organization, uh, as a placemaking organization. To try and get your sense uh, for issues, opportunities, things that you'd like to collaborate with us on so that we can do this all uh, together. So um, that's the general terrain. Uh, Eric's, uh, we're delighted to have Eric here. He's a um, uh, fantastic um, uh, figure in the, in the world of public art, uh, the head of the city's public art program, but has all sorts of um, background experience both in public art and uh, curation locally, uh, but also in the United States. And so uh, we're here to hear about some of your work, the city's work, um, but thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's it great. Thanks for inviting me. So, um, yeah, as I understood it from Christina and Darren, um, there's an idea of, of more formally addressing what a portfolio for public art might look like within the public space network. And um, so I wanted to be fairly brief in my initial talking bit and then be available to be part of a conversation as you open it out into, into however you want to talk about it, but to give a basis uh, for how the program works within the city and um, and some of the examples of the approaches that we take to to commissioning art. And um, and then I think um, the intro was interesting, thank you Andrew, um, that uh, uh, I spent a lot of time in rooms with uh, with people who, who come to public space from other disciplines, particularly landscape architects, architects, planners, um, and, uh, and, and engineers. And I'm often um, trying to sort out where I see art when it engages in the public realm, how it starts to intersect with those uh, disciplines without being of those disciplines. Um, and, uh, and trying to figure out a place to um, suggest suggest where public art and how public art contributes to a general sense of the public or the public realm, um, but often in 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 I end up kind of in environments where I'm speaking to a non-art audience, which is most of my time, uh, talking about what public art isn't from my perspective and what it doesn't do, and and how uh, not useful it is. Um, and then trying to get back around to this idea of by pursuing it in a useless way, how it ends up becoming, defining new uses. Um, so uh, uh, placemaking is something that comes up a lot and I'm often invited to enter conversations around placemaking and I think that public art in a place does contribute to a sense of that place often. Um, but, it, but I'm often then backing out of any sort of brief for a public art commission that says, well, we've got this site and we need to you know, turn it from a site into a place. Um, I don't want artists <coughs> to be uh, directly useful in that way, and I don't want them to be responding to a brief that's similar to what you would get in a design discipline. And I don't even actually know enough about planning to understand yet how, um, what the impetus is for a planning project that would be similar to the kind of design brief that an architect or a landscape architect 
might get. Anyway, um, preamble to say I'm always kind of coming in and like feeling like I'm trying to not give people what they want and then we'll work together and then we'll figure out that actually we were giving each other what we needed after all. Um, the presentation is kind of skewed towards sculptural art objects. That's just an accident of what pictures I had at hand from the presentation I was working from. Um, but I'm hoping to talk a little bit about how we're moving the, the program outside of, of simply thinking about sort of objects in space. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, this, when it comes up, will be um, where we're trying to start. This is actually based on a presentation that we're going to give to council as the, here's the introduction of cultural services and what we do, with public art being part of it. But uh, our new, um, I mean, we've used this language before, obviously, but our new um, dedicated indigenous arts and culture planner suggested starting the presentation with uh, an acknowledgement, um, not as a way of just getting it out of the way, but as a way of underpinning um, some goals that we're trying to run through the different aspects of cultural services. Um, but I'll move on from there. This should sort of float. Oh, really interesting font choices here on this computer. Um, <laughs> Only the best from West Van. <laughs> uh, so, uh, again, this is from the general, th this just kind of shows the many, many things across the city that cultural services involves itself in. Like we get brought into a lot of different conversations and often are interested in meeting them. Some that come through planning, um, some that, that are citywide initiatives um, that are meant to, to underline all of our work. Um, and then we have our own sort of initiatives that we're more directly involved with. Um, and we'll move on uh, to the next slide to show how, um, what the core areas of cultural services are, with public art being one of basically four areas around, um, in, which include grants, awards, and support programs. That's everything from um, funding organizations to the kinds of uh, uh, awards like the, um, and, and even the, the poet laureate of the city. Um, Cultural spaces and infrastructure at the bottom is a really big area of, of what the city does, and it's, it's fairly novel to me in my experience of city cultural services programs that it's such a robust part of what the city does, is trying to, um, as part of larger uh, developments and planning processes, ensure that space for artists, uh, living space, workspace, presentation space, the whole gamut is, is provided for. Um, and then policies and strategies is just uh, a kind of a burgeoning area right now, given that we've started on a, uh, we're midway through basically a creative city strategy, a new strategic plan um, to launch at the expiry of the current tenure plan that we're on, um, and other things that we get involved with like that. Okay, if we go to the next. Um, so the public art program provides for the creation of contemporary art for public spaces that expresses the spirit, values, vision, and poetry of place that collectively define Vancouver. The program supports excellence in art making by emerging and established artists in new and traditional media, from standalone commissions to artist collaborations. The Civic Collection includes over 300 public artworks created since the program began in 1991. I wanted to read it out because this is a boilerplate that we've been using for some time, and we'll look at it again as part of the Creative City Strategy. But um, I'm always taken by the fact that the people who uh, founded the program and the people who've been managing it, I've only been there since February of last year, um, really talk entirely about art when they're talking about public art. There's no mention of, you know, it's for public spaces. There's really no mention of any broader goals that, that are external to art. And um, that's a really strong position to take within a municipal public art program. And it's something that when I'm doing my, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this, but you're going to get what you, you know, you're going to get something out of it at the end. Um, it's from a basis of, of really thinking that by focusing on, on art and how art thinks, how art acts, rather than immediately trying to translate it into other realms, that we can get great results. Um, OK, if we go to the next slide. Uh, Areas of what we do within the within the program include planning and policy, which is a huge chunk of what I do. Um, sitting in on the very, very many um, large-scale plans that are underway within the city, ranging from everything from the new Broadway plan that's thinking about the whole area from 16th to False Creek, from Clark to Arbutus, I get that right? Um, uh, to area plans um, like the, the Northeast False Creek planning effort, uh, Britannia renewal effort, um, 
you know, Vitas Greenway, and then also um, being along for the ride and, and overseeing the public art planning aspects of major private developments like Oak Ridge or um, Little Mountain. Um, and uh, so there's a ton of work that way. Uh, and then that works through the Public Art Committee, which advises council. Um, that's, a, that's a council bylaw established committee uh, that oversees public art planning. Um, it oversees our policy rather than our product. So we don't bring uh, to them or to council actual projects, like actual artists, I want to do this. We do all of the evaluation at the very beginning. How are you going to plan for this? How are you going to commission artists? What's the budget? And then everything from then on goes on the basis of, of that approval has been secured. Um, and then to some extent we manage grants and donation proposals. I mean that's actually a, a, a growing part of what we do. Um, we've often undone granting programs. We had a major influx of funds from council two, three years ago now uh, that caused us to create kind of a new granting program. We're constantly thinking that through again and again, but trying to figure out how we can collaborate with organizations in the city to provide public art instead of running everything either through our own um, civic program or providing it all through public, um, public art provided through private development. We do have our own commissioning program uh, that commissions new public art citywide, uh, oversees private development, which is a huge aspect to how public art is, is created for the city, and manages the Signature Projects Fund, which was established four years ago to pool money to allow us to do larger uh, commissions. And then collection management, public relations, um, we now have a collection of some 300 works. Uh, they, I mean, some of them come from before the program was established in 1991, but uh, there's an increasing burden of maintenance on, on, on the program. Uh, we've done major projects recently with the Fondue and Clouds, the birds, and just this past week, we took down a 60-year-old um, totem pole, the centennial pole that's uh, near Vanier Park uh, for a major conservation project. Um, maintain an online registry, develop tours and public programs, and then we're really trying to work to figure out more ways to communicate around the work that we've done already. Um, we have a, a brochure um, publishing program, but to try to figure out more ways to um, create more conversation and discourse around the work that we've done. Okay, you're on the next slide. Um, so some specifics of how those play out. Planning and policy, I've already kind of run through this. Uh, the Northeast Falls Creek plan, the Arbutus plan, uh, the Broadway plan, uh, partly as part of the Millennium Line Broadway extension, and then we're just starting, uh, we're gonna um, just start to explore whether we need to, again, review the private sector program, just to ensure that um, that it's it's operating as, as intended. Um, and commissioning, currently, I and mean, this is some of the work that we have going on, we have six artist-initiated commissions, and I'll explain what that means in a few slides, I think. Uh, we do a whole bunch of temporary projects. We have a running indigenous mural program that we do in collaboration with Engineering's Graffiti Management Program, which commissions most of the murals that the city does in town and oversees most of the privately uh, delivered murals. Um, we're doing new temporary projects for Chinatown as part of the Chinatown Transformation Project, and uh, we're commissioning murals. Uh, we're commissioning a mural just up the street uh, for the new modular housing that's going to go in um, along. Uh, along Gore uh, in the, the Hogan's Alley Main Street blocks. We're doing a Musqueam project in Marpole with Robin Sparrow, um, and we're commissioning, just to highlight a, a, a partner project, well, sort of city, sort of partner. Uh, we're doing a new commission with Rebecca Balmore uh, and Oswaldo Yero for the Vancouver Library, the new floor, floors eight and nine that have just opened up. And then on maintenance, I already mentioned these two major projects that we've done recently, or have underway recently now. Um, so just to run through a few of the kind of approaches that we take. Artist-initiated commissions is, is the central um, approach of the city's program. And the idea there, as we practice it now, is to issue calls periodically. It's working out to be just about every other year that are very broad, very open calls that say to artists anywhere, but artists with some familiarity with Vancouver, they don't have to be Vancouver artists, uh, what, what kind of approach would you like to take to Vancouver? What is, what is a really faint glimmer of an idea of something that you would like to pursue in Vancouver? Um, we go through a panel process like we do with almost everything that we do, 
um, and make a short list out of the, I think we had 180 some submissions in, in 2017. We made a short list of about 15 artists and then funded them in developing proposals over the course of a few months and then convened the same panel again and figured out what we could fund of what came out of that. that. And so we're currently doing six new commissions across the city. Um, and this is, again, interesting because, and, and atypical from public art programs, because a typical municipal public art program, money will be generated by specific projects, and then money will be intended to be spent in relation to those projects. The funding, uh, City of Vancouver has never passed a percent for art ordinance. We, every other capital plan, it seems, do get some direct funds from council, but generally we're um, uh, drawing our budgets from a cut that we take on, on private projects. And that, means that the funds that we create are centralized and they can be deployed citywide. There's certain demand on us to provide uh, within the context of, of major uh, capital projects of the city, but there's also a general fund that can be um, deployed as, as desired. Not desired, it's not discretionary on my part, but through, through any kind of panel process. So um, a really site-specific project like Kenlum's Monument for East Vancouver uh, didn't come from a sense that there should be an artwork in Vancouver, East Vancouver or an artwork about East Vancouver or an artwork at the corner of 6th and Clark. It was really just an open call, an idea from a prominent Vancouver artist. And uh, the site for it, as I'm now discovering, could have been many, many places across town. It is where it is now. Um, but it's become a real uh, uh, civic marker. Uh, but it wasn't. Um, it didn't come through a process that was designed to create such a thing. Uh, and, but the Artist Initiate Commissions can happen at very many scales. We have a current project with Diana Acciati that's a series of um, art prints being deployed across the city on construction hoardings as if they were just wheat pasted posters. And that's a, a very light budget. It's a ton of work, it turns out, for the artist, but um, very temporary, very ephemeral, uh, all the way up to the scale of, of a work like Ken's. Uh, the private sector program uh, also uh, produces all sorts of very robust works that um, that can become really really central to the life of the city. Those tend to relate more specifically to to a site, obviously, um, but there's there's variations within that as well. Um, the private sector program works uh, based on rezonings. If you're rezoning a property, you uh, owe currently a dollar ninety eight per square foot. <coughs> Uh, with the only exception being for non-market housing to, towards public art that will be delivered on site or you can take a 20% discount, give us the money and we put it into the signature projects fund which goes to commissioning major works anywhere in the city. Um, generally developers pick uh, option A which is somewhat disappointing to us because we'd like to have more money for signature projects but it's also a sign that developers generally think that providing public art on site is a benefit to their projects, and so they'd rather spend the more money and go through all the work of, of working with consultants, managing selection processes, um, you know, integrating artists into design teams and del delivering projects at their development. So this is one from last year by Peter Gazendam for uh, Columbia College, again, not so far away from here, on uh, Terminal. Uh, signature projects, we actually have not done a proper signature project yet. We get easily distracted by sudden enthusiasms elsewhere in the city. And so we've been building up the funds towards some calls that we're going to issue in the next year or two. Um, but one of the major signature projects will be something that we've been asked to do by council through a council motion, which is to work with Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil to identify sites downtown um, and, and produce signature artworks uh, related to their goal of having more visibility on the land. This project from 2006 is a really impressive one in the history. I can always brag about things that I wasn't directly involved with as my role. Uh, <laughs> but um, Susan Point's uh, gates in Stanley Park uh, are really amazing in a lot of different ways. But one, one aspect of them is how they relate to the context, existing context of Stanley Park. as a site that was sacred to the local nations, a site that was removed from their traditional uses. And then immediately those uses were replaced by uh, totem poles by you know objects that that date that relate to other nations, other civilizations, civil, uh, nations often that they had 
uh, historically contentious relationships with. So these gates, this commission came out of a, a series of um, originally story capturing projects, capturing is a terrible word to use, I don't know where that came into my head, but um, a series of stories that were being collected by the city around um, Stanley Park and around indigenous history within Vancouver, leading to this major commission by Susan. <laughs> Point. Um, similarly, the, the motion to do uh, pursue new signature projects with the local nations came uh, as part of the conversation between the city and the nations about renaming significant plazas in the city um, at the Vancouver Art Gallery and at the Queen Elizabeth Theater. So that's one thing, and then we're also just identifying other sites in the city that could, could hold something really major, and then designing selection processes towards those things. Artists in Residence uh, is an increasing body of work. This piece, the caption disappeared, but it's it's uh, from last year. It's Justin Langlois, Should I Be Worried? Uh, just near the Canby Bridge. Um, Justin uh, made this project as the culmination of an 18-month residency with um, in planning with the sustainability uh, program. And uh, it, we're starting to get more demand for bringing artists into different parts of the city. And uh, in the wake of this, um, of, of Justin's uh, residency, we got a call from um, from engineering that they were going to hire a, an artist in residence, and they'd already hired a consultant to help them do it. And we were like, hey, wait, that's great, but slow down. Um, and they're they're midway through a project with with uh, Jermaine Co. currently that will also probably lead to commissioning. But it's key to the residency is that. They're not just about producing the artwork, they're about bringing an artist in relationship of the work of the city, uh, maybe hosting creative workshops, maybe participating in charrettes or, or different, uh, different workshops that aren't their own design, um, and kind of being an in-house consultant. Uh, and in the case of Jermaine's project, the demand for her has been so great that they've actually had to start to defend her against other parts of the city, like, yes, Jermaine's great, yes. I'm sure she could, you know, do something really in this, but that's not her scope. Um, so we're hoping to do more uh, to bring artists in relation to the city and then allow that to create new pathways for artists to find creative ways to collaborate with the city. Um, the next slide uh, is actually another form of a residency, but it relates to uh, how we work in partnership with other organizations and other agendas. The Blue Cabin, I don't know if you've heard about it yet, but it's a project that um, other sites for artist projects is working on in collaboration with the Grunt Gallery and a third organization that was founded basically just to operate the Blue Cabin. The Blue Cabin is a, uh, a shack that was on the north shore of, um, of the, of the uh, Burrard Inlet in North Van. It was built by uh, a Scandinavian uh, timber worker. Uh, and then was squatted for decades uh, by an artist couple, Carol Hitter and Al, um, no, uh, Neil, I think his last name is. Uh, and uh, it's just in, in sort of um, uh, basically unoccupied or sort of semi-industrial foreshore. Uh, it, they were evicted a few years ago. They weren't, um, the, the, the cabin itself was. And uh, these organizations got together around the idea of restoring this um, really interesting little cabin uh, to allow it to become a workspace for an artist. And the idea is that it would float on a platform. There'd be a tiny home uh, attached to the same platform that Jermaine may actually end up collaborating on. And then it's a residency space that can float around anywhere in the region. I mean, I guess technically it can float around anywhere that there's water. And we're finding it interesting currently in relation to the site where it's shown here in Northeast Falls Creek, where the city is in this planning effort that will play out in terms of constructability over probably 20 years to come. We want artists always in early, but how do you get artists onto a site when there's no site for them to be on? Or how do you get them thinking about creating art when you don't even know the form of the land that that art might go into? So in, in the context of the Northeast Falls Creek planning, Barbara Cole, who's the consultant who wrote the plan for it, proposed that there should be ways to have artists and art activities well before any actual um, uh, um, projects, permanent projects or commission. 
a way of bringing um, artist thinking and artist ideas to play in building a sense of the history and context of the site um, so that when it does come time to scrape the site and build all the new stuff, there will actually be not just the deep history of the site, which is super important, but also a recent history of engagement with the site uh, that will then benefit any other work that happens there. Um, I think I have one or two more. Uh, no, one more. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is another project that came through a private developer program, Jerry Pavick's Time Top, which is a time machine. And uh, it comes from a comic book, and it was immersed in the, the waters on the other end of the peninsula uh, for a year in order to build up these amazing encrustations. And it sort of exists as this marker of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a relationship to time in a space that's, that's constantly being rethought, rechanged, rejiggered. Um, even though it comes from the future, I think it kind of speaks in a way to, to any sort of length of time. Um, I didn't really talk about this at all, but I, it, I'm often thinking about, in relation to the Northeast Falls Creek uh, project, this idea that you'll hear from certain people that Vancouver is a young city, which obviously is not true, um, and it doesn't have a lot of history, which is also obviously not true. What it doesn't have is a lot of visible history often, and so ways of thinking about longer time frames than the built environment shows us, and I think, are, uh, are really important. So with that, I mean, that's kind of meant to just show what we are, what we do. Um, I can dig into any detail of that as needed, but I was interested in just creating a basis for whatever you guys wanted to talk about. Thanks for the